What's up, everybody? It's Johnny King. I say everybody, even though I'm really just talking to you, the listener or the, the viewer. Uh, another episode of the Becoming King podcast. I'm in my mobile office in the car because that's how I do it, whether I'm walking around the lake or walking up a mountain or interviewing someone fireside. I'm so excited to have our guest with us today, Alex Resnick. Um, we've had conversations before. He and I are two men cut from the same cloth. I think you're going to really enjoy our conversation. But, dude, thanks for, for being with me and the, the listeners and viewers yeah man thanks for having me excited to be here yeah 100 percent um i've got your your um beautifully written and detailed bio and yet uh i'd rather just hear from the the horse's mouth because i think it, it sprinkles more authenticity into the conversation because i know you, you went through a, a crazy uh, accident and so many different things but fill fill those in that uh don't know you like the if you can you know, the 30 second or the 30 minute version of, yeah. of, yeah, of your backstory and where you find yourself and what you're up to now. Yeah, absolutely. So currently uh, founder and president of Evolve Leadership, we basically provide sales consulting and communication skills training to businesses and individuals. So we work with corporate teams, managers, sales reps, employees, etc. We also uh, work with individuals who might go through our online courses or individual coaching, etc. Um, but Evolve is a culmination of experiences from my career, discovering, you know, my real passions, who am I really, what do I really care about? Um, the skill sets that I had to develop, a lot, of the, a lot of the painful mistakes we made along the way that, you know, you overcame challenges and you're thinking back to yourself, well, where were these answers when I was 18, 22, 28, and, you know, lost, stuck, miserable, confused, whatever, and the experience of all of that throughout my career is, is kind of what created Evolve and our mission. Our mission is be the help you wish you had, you know, throughout your, your life or your career. And kind of, you know, the, the short story. So I've been in, in sales and uh, business development for like, you know, 14 years, maybe 15 years now. Um, I, I was doing something that I think a lot of people can relate to where I was following what seemed to be the quote unquote right corporate path, right? Like, you know, right. Got out of college. Totally. I'm, I'm like, I'm in, I'm a financial advisor and you know, I'm you know, doing well and I'm wearing a cool suit and I, you know, I think it's all good, but little by little, my soul is kind of dying off inside. Um, totally. for a number of re I started in finance in 2008 too. It was a, it was a wild time to, to be there. It's very difficult to see a lot of people who lost so much. So that left a bad taste in my mouth. I went over to software sales and I was doing well on the surface and I was doing well as far as like, I was learning great skills, getting great experience with sales and communication, how to navigate the you know, kind of corporate world, et cetera. But little by little, I became uh, just really stuck and depressed and frustrated with just being like, is this it? I'm supposed to just do this thing I'm not that passionate about for the next 35 years, 40 years, and then retire. I was like, this just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and not necessarily like saying like the corporate world is good or bad or anything like that. It's just when you're following on a path that is not really, you're not connected to it in a deeper level. It's not something you're passionate about or you truly yeah. care about. You're doing it for like, you know, maybe social, uh, social reasons or family reasons, whatever, right? Financial reasons. Yeah, for sure. Financial reasons. Yeah. And those are all real things too. So I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, just screw it all and go follow your passion. It's like, ah, oh, well, I have kids and a mortgage and I can't just do that right away. So there's a way to do that. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with reality in that regard. Um, but, you know, what happened was I started to be on this pursuit of self discovery and really intentional self awareness, coaching, journaling, meditating, reading everything, podcasts, courses, right? We've all done it. Um, and I was implementing some stuff, but I was a little slow to start, maybe out of fear, procrastination, who knows. Um, and then in April of 2015, it was a Monday night, I was going to pick a friend up for dinner. I was making a left turn through a green arrow and some young gal who was texting and driving. So anyone listening to this, please just put your damn phone down when you're driving. It's just not worth it. I know you think you're the anomaly, anomaly and it won't happen to you, but it, it happened to me. This girl was texting and driving. She ran her red light and she crashed into me at 50 miles an hour. And yeah. luckily she hit my passenger side and no one was in my car yet, but my car is completely destroyed. Um, her car was as well. I thought they were going to be dead. Uh, they, they got out of their car and they were fine. They were completely shaken. And um, 
luckily I didn't have any major injuries either, which was weird. I actually had some survivor's guilt around that. I was like, why me? Like, you know, other people are killed, get paralyzed. like end up in the hospital. How come, how come this didn't, how come it didn't happen to me? I felt like weird about it. Yeah. But I also was like, well, why do I need to wake up paralyzed in the hospital to have my, to have my wake up call? Mm-hmm. Why does it need to be that? Can't it just be this? Because I could have died in that accident had she hit me on my side. Totally. Or I could have watched a passenger die have, had I had them in the car already. Right. I mean, it's like, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks, how precious life is and how, how we're just not guaranteed any amount of time. It could be, it could be six hours from now. It could be 20, 30 years from now. We don't know. And so I just decided to, to start living very intentionally based on what made sense to me and following things that I was curious about. I didn't really know what my passions were for sure, but I, I knew I wanted to follow more curiosity. And it was only like, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks later, I, I quit the corporate world and I, I went all in on a business idea that I had already been starting as a side hustle. This was like, I don't know, in 2015, so seven-ish years ago. Um, and ever since then, I've been very intentional about my career steps as each one was an intentional stepping stone to the to ultimately starting Evolve versus the wishy-washy like, oh, I'll just go chase another paycheck and some other, you know, corporate benefits that I don't really care about. And uh, yeah. yeah, so I guess that wasn't that short of a story. I don't know if that was a... <laughs> but, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. But one thing that you, I mean, you said something at the beginning of that a little bit that, that I would kind of want to notice, like, we don't realize how lucky we are because I think the vast majority of, well, for sure, the vast majority of previous generations, especially if let's just talk about men since this podcast is primarily focused uh, on men's health. Yeah. They probably like, we're all so much similar than we are different, even though we've all lived in different times. Right. Definitely. I guarantee you the vast majority of men will prop probably would feel that like I'm a farmer. And I don't resonate with this, but I have to do it to provide for my family. Like yeah. and how many men or they had to go to war or they had to go do the things that they didn't like doing. So they really didn't, they didn't have any other options. We have so many options now that you can't be like, oh my gosh, I have a come to Jesus moment and I'm going to pivot, you know, and again, they, they probably did have options, but maybe far fewer than we did or do. Yeah. And that, and that, probably started this cascade of like i'm deeply unhappy unfulfilled and so then it shows up in alcoholism right or some type of substance abuse or they're beating their children or their wife you know i'm talking about past lineage right yeah yeah and that this is an amazing time and why i love this conversation why i enjoy doing the podcast is that we have not only the opportunity but i feel like the uh, responsibility to do exactly what you've done which is like if we have this awakening, which I think anyone that's listening to this is either on their way or they've already had it, like you have to choose intentionality yeah. over just clocking in and clocking out and walking through life like a robot. Yes. Right? Yeah. A lot, you said a couple of things there that I really I, I love and I want to dig into a little bit. So intentionality, and let's come back to that because that's such a big one with being intentional around your decision making. But where does that come from? And that comes from clarity of who you really are, what you really care Mm -hmm. about, and the deeper of an understanding that you have of yourself, not only the better you connect with other people and can relate to other people and be compassionate for whatever someone else is going through, but the deeper understanding you have of yourself, you make much better decisions. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not a leaf blowing around in the wind at anything that comes your way. And you know, you're, you're not, you, you don't wave as waver the word You, you don't, you're not like, um, either insecure about your decision-making and what you want and what you want to pursue when with that clarity of who you are comes so much more confidence and better decision-making and a real integrity. What's that? Like integrity. I feel like you're in alignment with yeah. your heart's desire. Otherwise you're just like, Oh, shiny objects. Yeah, exactly. Funny sex. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, oh. And then you're like, you just spend, spend your lifetime just spinning your wheels. Exactly right. All those shiny objects will catch your attention. You know, like it, it's just because you're not clear on what your mission is. And by the way, even that can come and go. So I'm not, nothing I say here is to knock anyone who isn't clear on their mission. I spent most of my adult life not clear on my mission. All right. And now it's, it feels almost surreal to talk about feeling so sure about it now because it was such a 
pain, it, you know, it's such a process to get here. And I kind of thought it was like never going to happen when I was like, you know, 25 or 28. I'm like, how the fuck does anyone figure out what they want to do? How does anyone know? You know, it's like mm-hmm. how, how, like, and how come we weren't taught how to figure this stuff out? And that was some of the stuff that was some of the, uh, you know, internal work and research and self-discovery that I went on. I was just so obsessed with finding these answers. And so now I'm pretty clear on my mission. So someone could come to me today with a million dollar business idea and because, and it's just not aligned for me. I'm like, good, good luck. I'll be a sounding board for you. Five years ago, I'll be like, oh, wait, maybe that's my idea. Let's talk about it. How do we partner up? And now it's like, no, I'm clear. I'm, I'm completely focused on my mission. And so these other things don't, you know, I just have these natural boundaries around, uh, about around these things, but something else that you said with, with basically like almost like a responsibility to society. I've heard this thing. I think Jordan Peterson might've talked about it, but it was, it's almost like, if you think about what, what your gifts are, and sometimes we're a little, you know, maybe scared or um, there's like perfectionist procrastination or for whatever, maybe fear of judgment. I know it was, it was a big one for me. I would be afraid to share any of my, you know, quote unquote gifts with the world, how I could help other people. I was a little insecure to share that at first and, you know, make videos for social media, et cetera. And I saw this video of Jordan Peterson. He said, you know, flip the script where you actually have a responsibility to do that. You actually owe it to your community and society to do that. Because think about it, what if you could help somebody, you had the opportunity to help them with what you know, and you withheld the information. I mean, like, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, someone's yeah. over there and there's there, the rooms on fire and you have the fire extinguisher and you're like, ah, I think I'll just let them figure it out on their own. Like, no, go get them the damn fire extinguisher. Right. And so that you, you know, sometimes I, I'll say to clients, like, especially people who are trying to navigate their careers, the world does not need another disgruntled accountant who wishes they were a, um, they were cleaning up the oceans and an environmentalist. The world needs the passionate accountant who wants to help entrepreneurs with their money and the world needs the passionate environmentalist. Mm -hmm. We don't need the disgruntled, you know, Facebook ad marketing director who really wishes they were, um, a personal trainer, or maybe yeah. they wish they were in finance, right? So it's not judging like the career path of the thing. It's like, it's whatever it is that you're passionate about, you should kind of make it your life's work to discover that for yourself. And as you be, as you discover it, then sharpen that blade, right? You're the ax, sharpen the blade. How good can you get in this thing that you are, and it could be many things that you're passionate about. It's not like this one thing, and all of a sudden you have this right? Like, that's it. I mean, I think we all like probably 10 or 20 different things, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I see it as like a responsibility now. And it and it's, uh, it's a much better feeling, you feel much more committed to this mission that you're on versus just kind of like, willy nilly throughout, you know, day to day, not really sure what, what's the purpose of what you're doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting to me too, as you're talking about like sharpening skills and sales and leadership and that sort of thing is, what I was so when I finally woke up, I had my kind of wake up to like, oh shit, I've been just walking through life like a robot and and like my programming, uh, and how deeply unfulfilled I was was when I was at my first Tony Robbins event, and what I was probably most, well, one of the things that I'm most kind of like in awe of Tony Robbins, love him or hate him, the dude is so articulate. He's able to put simply into words things that I couldn't, that I hadn't, at least until that point, been able to articulate, right? Yeah. And so his ability to communicate, which I know a big part of what you harp on is communication, is what literally changed my life. And at the time, I had no skills, especially when I was married. Like I, I couldn't even begin to communicate how I was feeling or emoting for that reason, right? Okay. And I, and I, the, the, the more mature I get, the more I'm like, man, whether you're talking about sales, marketing, relationships, you know, like across the board, it, I think it really does all boil down to the number one thing, which is communication. Yes. Otherwise the shit falls apart. A hundred percent. Yep. Jump into a little bit more about how um, just improving one's communication skills is maybe your number one or in your top three of most important things as it relates to life, sales, business, success. Like, what's your whole philosophy on? Yeah. On communication? 
Yeah. I mean, I think it is the number one most important skill. There's also a lot of studies and data out there that supports that. I mean, LinkedIn came out with a study in 2018. Um, you know, obviously they have a tremendous amount of data on, uh, on jobs and, and from companies and long story short, the data said, and this, the former CEO of LinkedIn is like, uh, like interviewed saying this, the number one, basically the biggest skills gap is the number one thing they want to see. And it's also the number one most lacking is communication slash soft skills. And I don't love the term soft skills. I think it's misunderstood. And I think a lot of these terms are misunderstood. So, yeah. um, we like to call them human skills because it's about human connection. That's what every single yeah. thing ultimately comes down to is mm -hmm. connection, relationships, starting with the one that you have with yourself. And then that also, and so how do you connect with other people? How do you connect with yourself through your communication? And that could be verbal and nonverbal. So to answer your question, yeah, we think it's the number one most important skill because it's, it's, it, it touches every single area of life. The quality of your life is largely going to be dependent on not only, but largely on the quality of your relationships, the quality of your relationship with yourself, the quality of your relationship with other people. Think about it. The worst thing you could do to a human is solitary confinement. Yeah. Right. And so besides death penalty. And so we, whether you like it or not, whether, you know, you're, you're pissed off at your dad and you haven't talked to him in a few years, or you think that you could go without, you know, family, this or friends, that it's taxing on you subconsciously, emotionally, and mentally. When you are lacking those connections, like you said a few minutes ago, you seek out connection in other places like drugs and alcohol, right? Sex addiction, porn, social media, all these other things. It's just a different form of connection that we're not getting from these other places. Yep. And so with communication, um, a couple of things that I want people to, to think about is it's not like uh, you're born with it or you weren't, right? You might have yeah. a tendency towards being a little bit more talkative or understanding people a little bit better. Like, I think I naturally, I'm, I'm a very empathetic per person and um, naturally kind of pick up on people's energies quite quickly. And um, I'm curious about people. So yeah, I have an inclination towards that, but I had to really sharpen a lot of my communication skills, especially in college and after college. Yeah. And um, so like the big things is they are practicable improvable, learnable. It's not, it's also not about being the, it's not about being extroverted. It doesn't, it has, it doesn't have to do with extroverted or introverted. That's just where you get your energy from. And, and so a lot of the most famous public speakers that you might ever see, they're introverts off stage. They've still sharpened their communication skills. A lot of leaders are introverts uh, outside of the boardroom or wherever it's, you know, that's not uncommon. So it's not an introvert extrovert thing. It's not an outgoing thing. It's not about being the funniest guy at the bar with all the jokes of the loud mouth. It's about how do you connect with other people? Do you make other people feel heard, seen, and understood? And to the degree that you can do that, you're going to build really great relationships that have a foundation of trust. And from that trust is where you can lead, influence, sell, have a relationship, be successful dating, get your damn kids to listen to you, right? It all it comes from that place. If people don't feel like you really give a shit, it's a, you're, it's, you're pushing a boulder up a hill to try to get people to do something. If people can feel like, yeah, Johnny, like he pays attention. I feel like he just gets me. Then when you have the request, when you are leading the team, when you are trying to close that client and sell, you are, you're putting all the cards in your favor for the outcome to go in your way. And so um, I just can't think of a better thing for people to spend some time improving than their communication skills. It's just, it just touches every area of life and it'll right. only help you. Do you feel like there's a um, symbiotic relationship between improving one's communication skills and improving one's emotional intelligence? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're both deeply connected and intertwined. Emotional intelligence, I think, is an interesting topic because we've all heard about it, but I don't, yeah. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just because the word emotion or emotional is in there. I don't know, but it seems to be one of the most overlooked or dismissed topics, which yeah. blows my mind because it is the secret weapon. Like, 
right. all your genius. That is the superpower right there. It blows. When I learned about it, I got lucky in college. Um, I took a course called Emotional Intelligence in the Workplace. And this was a long huh. time ago. It's like pretty progressive. And to me, it was absolutely mind blowing what we were doing in there. And I remember a lot of my like finance and econ major friends were like, oh, this is lame. Like, I want to learn about money. And I'm like, dude, this is going to make you all the money you ever want in your life. You're going to understand people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think emotional intelligence is one of those topics that it's like, we see it, maybe it makes us cringe. Maybe we think we're emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence, so we just move on and we don't do anything about it. But it is one of those areas that I strongly encourage people put some, some practice around. But I like to actually just focus on a few core areas. I think there's like almost too many subtopics of emotional intelligence. People are like, oh man, like this is overwhelming. What the hell do I have to learn? What do I even do about this? So for anyone listening out there, I think the most powerful place to start is emotional management or self-regulation. It's one of the pillars of, of emotional intelligence, basically mm -hmm. staying calm, cool, and collected when you feel your emotions triggered, right? We're, we're especially as men, especially in this country, we have grown up with this idea that like it's macho and badass to have this like triggered temper. You have a lot of people, Oh, I'm soup. I have a bad temper. Eh, that's just a story. You know, it's just a story we've lived into since we were little. It's like, that's, that's something that you could, you could practice not having a bad temper period, yeah. but the, yeah. the, until, but the stories all wound up in your head or you modeled what you saw, you know, your dad do or your grandpa do or, or friends or whatever. And we, you know, we just pick up on all, we're just a sponge over the years. And we just pick up on all these things a lot of times subconsciously, totally. um, but managing your emotions, staying calm, cool, and collected, especially when tensions are high. You're in a difficult business conversation. You're about to be maybe in an argument with a spouse or a friend or a loved one. Um, you're talking to a client and you're getting some serious objections that could rattle, you, rattle your cage a little bit and throw you off course just a little bit. Your ability yeah. to catch that trigger, recognize that it is a trigger, pay attention to the emotion right, right there. We're starting to strengthen emotional intelligence muscles. This one in particular self-regulation or emotional management, either right. one. Right. And it's being observant of that. And then the more you reflect and, and then the next thing you want to do is be an observer. So you're like, huh, how come when that person says that, or if a client objects, why, why should that bother me so much? Or how come right now I'm feeling pretty pissed off when that person cut me off in traffic? I mean, all they really did is just a person in a car who moved over into, in front of my car. Why am I losing <laughs> my mind? Someone next to me can get cut off in traffic and they don't think twice. Right. right. You say some political figures names and everyone immediately has a real committed. It's like, yeah. why is that? And so taking a look at why, where it comes from, very valuable. But in the moment, taking a quick, deep breath and coming back to neutral, calm, cool and collected. And the ability, the more that you practice doing that, you strengthen that EQ muscle. Yeah. And that right there is such a superpower. Think about like. And again, there's this whole macho thing around like having a, you know, um, you know, quick temper, for example, but like all the badass dudes in movies, for example, the, you know, the James Bonds of the world, what is something that we all notice about them? They are calm and cool as hell when things go crazy, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. Daniel Craig, Casino Royale, that guy tried to kill him, goes out to his Aston Martin, <laughs> revives his own heart. Comes back to the poker table, still cracking jokes, calm as hell, goes and beats the guy in poker. Any, any one of us would have been like, what yeah, yeah, the yeah. fuck? And try to go kill the guy, right? <laughs> and so, right. you know, uh, my buddies who are Navy SEALs too, I mean, their constant training to stay calm and focused on the operation at hand while they have bullets whizzing by their heads. That's a, that is a type of emotional intelligence. That is real strong self uh, self-regulation, emotional management. So that's, I, I want to shout that one from the rooftops, especially for your listeners who, I mean, any guys out there, you want to change your life and you want to have better outcomes at work, financially, sales, dating, be calm. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're ignoring your emotions. Doesn't mean you're becoming a pushover. You're calm. There's strength in calm. There's better decision-making in calm. There's confidence in calm. People confide in you. 
someone mm-hmm. says something that should otherwise piss you off and you can say, hey, no, let me understand where you're coming from. Let's have a conversation versus what the fuck? You're an asshole, right? Massive difference in how the outcome of that conversation is going to go and how you're going to mm-hmm. ultimately get your way and influence versus have a conversation turning, you know, a big blow up argument or something. So there's a lot of power in that. But I do feel like a big part of that, that I want to make sure that those that are listening or watching get for me personally, it's like, I used to look at Michael Jordan, huge, huge, you know, influence on my life when I was younger. Um, like you said, James Bond, all of the movie guys, I saw just someone that never cracked. I never really emoted a ton. Um, and my pattern then became, I am like stoic. I am like, and so I found myself in relationships where, you know, the significant other was like, let me see something. Yeah. Let me like, let me connect with you. You are just, you are as you're flatlined. Yeah. And I, but inside I'd be like boiling and then I'd eventually get a, I'd have, hit a breaking point and I still wouldn't burst or throw shit or rage. Cause I was the nice guy. I would just turn off. I would no longer hear anything else that they're saying. I'd yeah. more or less leave. I just jet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now to your point, now it's like, Oh, like it's the curiosity of like, oh, that fucking pisses me off. I feel this. I'm feeling myself getting hot. Like my hands are getting sweaty. I'm feeling like, oh shit. And then I'll say, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll like name it. I'm like, you know what? That triggered me a little bit. If I'm having a conversation with a significant other, you know, yeah. it's like, I know you didn't intend it to probably trigger me. Uh, and in my mind, I'm thinking like, this probably goes back to not feeling safe or seen when I was a little boy. Okay. I yeah. get all that. So that's the understanding of kind of like, connecting dots and be like, if it gets so heated that sometimes I'm like, I need to take about 20 minutes. Let me go cool off, come back yeah. and have it. I, I think that's such a healthier approach. And I'm not just saying that about me. I'm saying for all of us to have those skills. So it's not just repression and suppression and then it turns right. into aggression. It's more like actually being connected. Like, okay, I can feel this in my body and then be able to talk about it, admit it, not feel like we're weak because I'm triggered right now. Right. And that's all right. part of the communication skills that I think are healthy as if we're just Spot supposed on. to like be James Bond all the time, which is not necessarily always healthy. Right. You know? Yeah. It's a so, great point. I, I'm glad you brought that up because one, I can really relate uh, big time. And it's, you know, it's one of the many reasons that I'm on this pursuit of scratching my own itch of being like, man, how come I do get so triggered and I, you know, lose my temper at this person. And this is, you know, my teens and twenties of not having it all figured out. I, I mean, I'm not saying I have it all figured out, not even close, but having a couple of things figured out that I'm like, Oh, these have actually like helped me massively in my life. So to your point, it's definitely a balance and it's not about ignoring your emotions, strengthening a muscle of being able to stay calm. So you could think clearly and act in a more effective way is not the same thing as ignoring your emotions. So they bottle up. And that's why then sharpening the blade of communication skills, if you will, is so important because then you can articulate, like you said, you know what you said that thing, you probably didn't mean to hurt my feelings, but it did trigger me. I am feeling a little bit frustrated right now. And I either, I need a breather before, you know, like I need five or 10 minutes. Just give me a minute to chill. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And you're recognizing the emotion. Also, the more that you can, so that, so the better you can communicate how you're feeling, this is not like only for women. This, this is a superpower for men too. It's, but, which I know is not, you know, oh, it's not cool. I don't talk about my feelings. No, like yeah. you got to have someone in your world that you can at least, you know, release the pressure, uh, you know, just a little bit. And a good way to do that is, is talking about them from the perspective, like you're observing them because you are not your feelings. You are not, you're not a pissed off person you're a human being, right? And in this moment, you are feeling the emotion of being pissed off, frustration, whatever. And being able to separate the two and observe the two and then separate the two, especially if you're talking to a spouse or a loved one. It's, yeah, yeah I mean, and then you can have the real productive conversations coming from a place of compassion and understanding. So you're showing that person that you're trying to understand their world, but you're also sharing with them how what they said or did made you feel. It was a really great book called Nonviolent Communication. But he, and this is also what we learned in uh, that EQ class in college. Again, it's, it's so crazy. The further I got into my adult life, I was like, damn, that was like really mind blowing stuff because it was just, you know, ahead of its time, I guess. 
is, so this is another, you know, um, helpful skill for anyone listening is keep the language as objective as possible and not subjective. So an, an example of that would be like, you know, when you said this, it made me feel this way, not, mm -hmm. not, and then, so it's, I'm feeling this way. So you're taking, it's, it's a, you're taking the responsibility of the feeling you're sharing with them. That feeling came from a, an action that they might've done, but that's a big difference than saying you're being an asshole. Right. How are you going to go? How do you think that conversation is going to go? You immediately put that person on the defensive. And so, um, and it could even be, you know, you can observe it throughout your day to day and it doesn't have to be some giant conversation all the time. It's like, Hey, you know, when you, when you pick your phone up and you look at your phone while I'm speaking, it makes me feel like you're not really paying attention. I, you know, it kind of doesn't really feel that great. Would you mind just putting your phone down while we talk? Oh mm -hmm. yeah, sure. So sorry. Mm -hmm. Versus you never pay attention to me. You don't mm -hmm. care about me, mm -hmm. right? Objective versus subjective. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really, really helpful way to communicate. Anyone looking for more info on that, obviously you can hit me up, but just check out the nonviolent communication book. Um, does a great job of explaining that. There's plenty of good books out there like that, but that's one that comes to mind. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah, I think man. that's super powerful. <clears throat> nonviolent communication. And I was just going to say too, I mean, all the stuff that we're saying, obviously we're talking about in relation to relationships, maybe intimate, maybe not. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still, it's still more or less sales. I mean, you don't go into, like if you actually are a salesman and you're looking to sell something, you, want, you must find a win-win where they feel that they're you know, agreeing to, to purchase. So they're right. acquiring value you know, that, that you can offer. And then of course you receive the value of let's say monetary or anything else type of exchange. But it's a total win-win versus right. where a lot of us, you know, it's like you said, like you fucking always do this. Like that puts them on the defensive and it more right. or less very equally becomes, I'm going to win, you're going to lose. Right. And for a lot of guys, especially when it comes to competition and sports, that's like just how our brains work. And it right. has to kind of have to work against that, that uh, normal, you know. Yeah thought process and so so if you can let's let's dig in a little bit more about like sales specifically because sales is happening whether we're talking about dating <laughs> or we're talking yeah. about a relationship where like you know a, a, a marriage or a relationship is going to start to crumble if if there's not win-wins happening often right when people yeah. both aren't getting their their needs met right but Absolutely. how does that how does that whether we're talking about relationships or we're talking about corporations because i know you work with a lot of like business to business and that sort of thing, or one-on-one -on -one with individuals. This is, I feel like communication is the bedrock to sales, but let's dive a little bit further into that whole kind of idea of like, like why sales is so important, having empathy and kindness and grace. Yeah. In regards to like, you don't think about those things sometimes for like corporate environments, but like, I think that's, that is the, like you said, the game changer. Yeah. And the fact that we don't think about it for corporate environments is like, it's painful that the human connection is so lost. It seems like maybe there's a movement to people, you know, um, companies so, yeah. in general, bring in more of a human first approach to business because that is the, and in a whole entire business, it's just made up of people. It's people working together to solve problems for other people. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, it's so weird when people are like, Oh, it's just business. Don't worry about it. It's like, I mean, not really. This is a group of humans. Yeah. And are like, what are you talking about? Um, and so, yeah, part of our mission with Evolve was to get more. I think Adam Grant has a book called like back to human, but I just love that is like a more human first approach to business. It doesn't need to be so separate. So yep. So to touch on a couple of things that you, uh, you know, you brought up with sales and communicating and, and uh, you know, kind of whether it's relationships or selling uh, to a client, influencing the outcome of people around you. If you're a leader, by the way, everybody's a leader. You don't need to wait for a promotion right. or a title. You are your life's leader. Yep. You want it to go well, be intentional, be a leader. And everyone's leader, but everyone's in sales, aren't they not? Yeah. There's so many it, people who are like, I don't, I don't, I don't like sales. I'm not a salesperson. Like, uh, -uh. it's like right. such a. I'm a used car salesman. No. Like, yeah. No, it's got so many bad. Yeah. It's got so many bad things. It's like, okay, well, do you want anything in your life to go your way? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> like ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or are you like totally cool with like things just like one after another, just not going your way? Oh my yeah, God. That would yeah. be a, 
frustrating way to live. I used to be yeah. more on that side of the, uh, of the spectrum, which is why I became so obsessed with learning all of this. And so, yeah, if you want to influence outcomes in your life, you're in sales to some degree. And so a really great way to think about it is first, let's, let's get rid of some of the cringy sales cliches that are out there. Sales does not have to be cringy. We associate it to the used car salesman and the insurance, this, and like, you know, and, and those poor guys, they get such a bad rap, right? But like, it's like, it is an old school style of selling that isn't so much the case anymore. Or obviously, I actually, it still surprisingly is, but it's because people have the wrong mindset about sales. Part of it is because the consumer has all the, has so much more access to information now. So like 20, 30, 40 years ago, you needed the sales rep to get information. There wasn't social media, there weren't websites, you couldn't just, so now the sales rep comes in way later at the buying cycle. So if we're just like isolating the sales conversation for a second, a sales professional comes in way later at the buying cycle. And so they are not the gatekeeper of all this great information. A, a customer is going to show up like pretty well versed on probably like the two, three, four companies they might actually work with. They probably already know a decent amount about your product. And so yeah. the, the, the days of being salesy and pushy, at least in a B2B environment, um, they're over or they should be. Because if you're salesy, you, you're, it's just fake and cringy and you turn people off. Um, you get, you know, you could just feel someone's commission breath, their, their, their agenda, like all they care about is quota. And you're like, oh my God, calm down. Yeah. So for anyone out there who thinks they're not in sales, but especially if you are a, an entrepreneur and you got to grow your business, um, or if you just want to influence outcomes more in your life, just take the case that sales is really sol solving people's problems through a process of getting to, getting to know somebody well. And what are the things that they care about? What are the problems that they need solved? And you want to approach it from, and when you brought up the teams thing, it's like, I have to win, you have to lose. We have to unlearn that. Yeah. It's not about the sales professional winning the deal and the client like somehow got screwed over and ended up signing on the dotted line. It's not yeah. you versus the client. It is you and the client on the same team versus the problem at hand, which is what the client is trying to solve. And if you have that mindset, and not your attachment or neediness to the outcome of a sale. So if you could stay neutral about that and you don't, and a lot of people, a lot of sales reps get quota pressure. That's a real thing. You know, it's coming down to the end of the month of the quarter and you're scrambling to make your number and you could come off a little bit more desperate than you'd like to. You got to really pay attention to that. You don't want to bring needy energy into a sales meeting or any conversation ever period, right? There's no faster True. way you'll lose the deal or lose the girl. If you bring needy energy to an interaction. Yep. So you don't need anything. You are already whole, right? Let's go spiritual for a second. You don't need this to go a certain way. So if you could just be truly present with the client and understand their world, what have you tried to do to solve this problem? What did you like? What didn't you like? In a perfect world, what would this problem fix? What would that look like? How would that impact your business? If we don't get this fixed, how's that going to impact your business? How much longer can this go on? I'm here to understand so that I could make good recommendations. If we're the, by the way, we might not even be the right fit for you, right? We don't know yet. So we're, we're in a collaborative problem solving conversation, not a me versus you. Here's how great my product is. Let me convince you on features and benefits. And I'm not really asking the client enough questions because I just want to push my product on them. Those days have to be gone. And yeah. so that will, what I just explained will put a lot of people who think they don't like sales at ease because mm -hmm. it's not a salesy process then. Okay. So if you've really solved their problem and then you earn the right to get their business because it's an exchange of value. Um, and so that can translate over to other corporate environments. If you're a manager and you're, you have to lead your team and you're talking to your employees and your job is to understand all of your employees individually as humans understand what motivates them. What do they care about? What are their challenges? How can you help? And it, and have the same mindset. It is you and your employee on the same team versus the challenge at hand. Uh, I needed a couple extra days off. Um, I worked too much last week. I need more time to be with my kids and pick them up after school, soccer practice, whatever the challenge is. Okay. How can we collaborate and be on the same side of this problem? Not manager versus employee. And I got to strong arm them into this thing that I, you know, and especially these days, if you're going to have that management bossy style, those employees, they start getting disgruntled. They're out of there. I mean, 
what, three months, six months, a year. And then that costs you two to three times their salary just to replace them all. It's like, you, it's all about the human connection, understanding people, your team, your colleagues, your spouse, your client, whoever, what makes them tick? Where do they come from? Why do they feel the way that they do about this, you know, topic at hand? The more you can understand that, the better you can help, the better you can support, lead, you know, problem solve, et cetera. Right. Right. I think I go back to the uh, idea, which, which just reiterates the, the point that you've made multiple times during this conversation. It's like, you know, shortly out of college, I got my first, I bought my first car, a used car. And I felt like I got more or less bamboozled into it. And there was like a weird mm. smell in the car, but I like couldn't face it. it kind of smelled like Febreze, something else. And I wasn't excited about it, but I was trying to make a non-emotional decision and a, like a good financial decision. And I, and I remember driving out of that lot with a brand, like with not a brand new, with a used Saturn, like piece of shit car. And it dawned at me at the very first stoplight, this was someone's car that, had been a smoker yeah that's it i was like oh and i was so upset that i felt like i should have followed my intuition i felt like this salesperson was manipulative but they were good at what they did and they just like i said bamboozled me into it could have gone back sure but i was insecure too i didn't really feel like anyone was guiding me in that like sales process but that left a bad taste in my mouth or my nose for that matter um and it made me realize that like To your point, I feel like the going back to what we've been saying the whole time, when you really focus on understanding self and you're truly connected with who you are as a man, which is why I'm doing this podcast in the first place and doing the work I'm doing, then I think it's so much easier to come unattached to an outcome. Yeah. And again, to your point, it's like, I don't, we might work together. We might not, you know? And so for me and working with clients one-on-one or whatnot, it's like a lot of times it's just so much easier for me. I don't want to do high pressure sales anyways. I've done a lot of sales courses and you're really like, well, you got to push the objections. You got to do this and this and this. It's like to get them through the sales process so that they say, yes, I'm kind of like, I don't know that it just doesn't resonate with me. Yeah. I think think it's uh, for anyone that's listening to this, who is in sales and we're all in sales. Like, let's be honest. Like I said earlier, like, being authentic, knowing yourself, having EQ, you know, emotional intelligence is, is like I said, the, the bedrock. But you also wrote me something before we, you know, prior to getting into this. And you wrote, like, I'd love for, you, for your audience to truly understand that everything they want in their personal, professional lives is on the other side of deepening their self awareness, raising their emotional intelligence, and becoming better communicators. They're all connected. They're all I connected. Think that's, that's it. Otherwise, you're really going to be just going through the paces of following your little sales script to get an outcome because that's what you're really attached to. And that's really, and don't get me wrong, it's really difficult when you're like, especially if you've got the pressure to, to hit quotas, to, to make sales, like as part of, maybe you are literally a salesperson in, in the corporate America, or corporate world. Like, I get that. But I do feel like you're going to ultimately be a lot more successful in life and be a lot more fulfilled if you're coming from that place of like, genuinely looking for a win-win otherwise it's like yeah i got that sale but probability of them returning it or canceling whatever yeah. is so much higher than them actually being truly happy with the outcome yeah absolutely so i feel I mean, like no, go ahead no yeah actually go ahead well i was just gonna say so i think that the coming back around to your initial point of like how important communication is um i i would i could see myself 12 13 14 years ago listening to me like okay so give me some tactics on how to become a better communicator when now i can see it's like if you actually get into to the men's work if you actually get into working on yourself whether it be through this podcast through books through retreats coaching therapists whatever that does ultimately have an effect on your ability to connect, to empathize, oh, yeah. to be a better salesperson, so to speak. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, man, I wish everyone understood this sooner. And I did the same thing. Like I remember, you know, you're young and you're like, like, what's the perfect pickup line? What you're in sales? Yeah. What's the perfect closing tactic? What's this tactic trick, tip or trick, or, you know, whatever? And like, there are some that can like, you know, 
nudge you in a better direction. But that's not the fix. That's not the solution you're looking for. What you really got to do is the inner work of, and that's the self-awareness stuff that I, that I talk so much about and, and believe so much in is like the byproduct of knowing yourself deeply comes with this calm confidence that results in being able to close more clients, being able to be a more confident sales professional, leader, employee, et cetera, entrepreneur, being able to be someone who can get the date and keep the girl around because you're actually, you know, you weren't just a bunch of, if you were just a bunch of lines and scripts on your first date or two, you ultimately get to a point where if you're going to try to have a relationship with that woman, she's going to see like, oh, you're, this guy's not as solid internally. It's disingenuous. It's yeah. And I see a lot of guys who, you know, it's like their approach to, to their solutions are the, let me buy the, you know, the nicer clothes, the flashier, this, the new haircut, that the new car, this, uh, I got a couple lines I saw on some pickup YouTube video or whatever. And you, and then you, you hear them in a real conversation and all you hear is, you know, complaints or a wounded pup or someone who's got low self-esteem. And I'm not knocking anybody, by the way, I'm just saying, it's, it, you, you can't go on that way for so long. It's not the answer you're looking for. So if you're yeah. doing the inner work, the men's work, as you put it, the deep discovery of who am I really? What do I really care about? What are my passions? What are my interests? And if you're not sure where to go, where, like what these answers are, that's perfectly fine. Just start journaling. At, at mm. night, pull out a journal, pull out a, pull out a Google Doc. I use Google Docs because I just type faster, closer to the speed of my thoughts. I write my handwriting so shit that I'm like, I don't even know what I just wrote down anymore. <laughs> I probably should practice my handwriting because it's that bad now. But um, like, go for a walk and think about these things. Question prompts like, how did my day go today? What were things that maybe pissed me off a little bit and why? What is yeah. it about that thing? Where do they, where do they find real joy today or in my work? So maybe I don't love my job, but I love this aspect of my job. Cool. What is it about that? And look for things that give you energy. So where, and so pay attention to the energy. So what are people, relationships, environments, tasks, creative tasks, work that either give you energy or deplete your energy? What is it about those things? The things that give you energy, pay very, very close attention to them and nurture those things. Then also look at your curiosities. When you're, if it's deep down and you're like, man, I, I wish I could have done more than that, man. Like, I know for me, it was like, I, I'm like, I have a, I'm like, I'm, I wish I played the drums. Like, I'm oh, drums are so freaking cool. Like, I think guitar is cool too, but like drums are so cool. And then I like thought about it in my last apartment, but I was like, oh, it's going to be too loud. And now it might be too loud in this apartment, but I know I can get an electric set. That's just like kind of like a silly example. But like, I remember a few years ago, I was like so curious about traveling more to South America. But like, I was like, for no real reason at all, I wasn't really pulling the trigger on it. And then I finally was like, wait, what the hell am I doing? Boom, I booked my trip to, you know, Medellin, Colombia, you know, a few days later. So it's pay attention to the things that you're curious about. Don't judge them. And the more that you do this discovery, you get it, you start to get a sense of who you are, what you care about. And then I would encourage you even deeper work like the work that you do. I've done some um, leadership type seminars, you know, the three, four day all intensive that take you all the way back to your childhood that you, did, you didn't know you were going there. And you were like, oh yeah. my God, I think that way now because I was picked last at recess when I was nine. What the yeah. fuck? Yeah. Right. And so <laughs> all of that, should be this ongoing journey that we have for the rest of our lives, the same way that we, you know, shower and eat food every day. Like it should just be, even yeah. if it's just a five or 10 minute thing, go for a walk after work, journal for five minutes before you go to bed, do a little meditation. These things are change your life. And then, on the, and then the byproduct of that is you don't need a closing tactic. You'll know how to close the client because you're showing up as a more calm, confident individual. Of course, you can get some training on how to navigate that conversation, but only after you've done that kind of, not after, but it's not a supplement to doing the deep inner work. The deep inner work is, that is what will change your life forever. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's, you know, I think it's in a category self-awareness. Self-awareness is basically the accurate assessment of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then it's yourself internally, but then also how you show up for others. And so that's another big one too, where it's like, you might think you're a really nice guy 
Uh, but if you had to interview five of your friends and they were going to be perfectly honest and maybe like, dude, you kind of get pissed off pretty easily. And people are afraid to, to like, you know, disagree with you. And honestly, lately you've been complaining a lot and you're over here mm -hmm. in your head thinking, I thought I was like the nicest guy ever. And I'm not getting calls or invites to things and I can't figure out. And then you it's, we're quick to blame the other people, right? Like, Oh, they, they must be some idiot. Oh, you know, none of these girls want to see me for a second or third date. They all suck. Really? Is it all of them or is it you, <laughs> you know, yeah. anywhere you go, there you yeah. are. Right. That's the saying. So it's the accurate assessment of yourself <laughs> internally, but also how you're showing up for other people. Um, and then oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, so the, and the other thing that people really need to realize is we bring all of this, there's, I call it like this invisible barrier in communication. We bring all of this crap that we've collected throughout our lives into our relationships. I almost envision it like, it's like, you know, that game where everyone's inside a plastic bubble and they run into each other. It's almost like yeah. every, we're all in our own little bubble of our past experiences and traumas and our already made up minds and our beliefs and our opinions. And, you know, so we live in this bubble, whether we realize it or not. And it comes from the experiences that we've had throughout our life and what we've made them mean. So it's not so much literally what happened, but it's the meaning attached to it, right? Because we all know someone who's an alcoholic because their dad was an alcoholic. And we all know someone who's never drank a day in their life because their dad was an alcoholic. Right. So it's not so much the event, but it's what we made it mean. And there's mm -hmm. people out there and this, I was partly this person, you, you know, take, you know, let's take a, a 10 year old raises their hand in class. They have the wrong answer. Everybody laughs at them in that moment. They said, I'm never going to get embarrassed again. I'm not raising my hand anymore. Fast forward. No, they're sure. they're sure. 35, 40, 45 years old, still not speaking up in the office, mm -hmm. even though they have the answers. They might've thought about the answers 10 minutes before everybody, but they're not going to speak up and they don't even realize that's why they do it. But it's the series of limiting beliefs that we've created over our lives. And then you could be sitting next to me and you raised your hand and you had the wrong answer. And you were so embarrassed that you're like, I'm never going to be wrong again. And so yeah. you became super studious and you loved volunteering because you knew for sure you had the right answer, right? Same thing happened. We raised our hands and we were wrong. And then two completely different trajectories. You go on to be the CEO of a company because you are letting the world know how much value you have in your noggin. And I'm going on and I'm only mid-level, maybe at best, not, not reliving into my full potential because I'm too afraid to let the world know what's going on in my noggin, right? In my, in yep, my head, yep. in my world. And obviously it's yep. like a simplified example, but our whole life is experiences of that. And so we bring that crap into all of our conversations. That's why we don't truly listen. We listen through a filter of what we think this person is or isn't based on our worldview. Yep. We, look at the yep. we look at the world through a lens of what we've already made up in our minds of how the world is. Mm -hmm. And so all of that, and I, I know you know this very well from your work, all of that comes from these, these collective experiences that we've, we've had over our years and we bring them into conversations and relationships and we don't even realize it. Yeah. It's subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. And those put blockers in between communicating. And so a good way to disarm them quickly, I think you still have to do the work and discovery on yourself, but to disarm them in the moment is by truly being empathetic, compassionate, and understanding when you're talking to somebody dropping your ego. So basically recognizing that you have an opinion, maybe an opposing argument. And instead of chiming in with yep. your opposing argument, can I just sit and listen to this person and understand where they're really coming from? Maybe I disagree. I don't, I don't need to talk about it right now. Let me just try to get where they're coming from. And that's basically, you know, practicing empathy. And from there is when you start to bring those barriers down, right? We start to step outside of that little plastic bubble that we're all in and actually see each other as people. Yeah. Well, and I feel like too, the, I mean, at the end of the day, which is again, the, the kind of like the biggest part of my messaging personally, and I hear it kind of maybe just because it's on my lens that I look through life and it's like, us as guys, we can achieve all the things we can have the significant other, we can have the cars, the money, and all, like all of it is for not if you don't have fulfillment in your right. life. If you're not happy, right. like as yourself and, and all that stuff. And so if we have all of these limiting beliefs and all this shit that's getting in the way of actually being able to connect with other people, 
I think that's that's really exactly. where it comes down to sales, comes down to the relationships, being able to communicate and connect within those relationships of, like you said, me with myself, me with you, me with Mother Nature. There's so many things that we're obviously always connected with, right? right? And if we're if we're not if we're feeling deeply disconnected, then then that's where I think you have found yourself. I found myself like I have all the things, and I'm deeply unhappy, deeply unfulfilled. Yeah what the fuck like something needs to change and so i do feel like there's a lot of guys that are listening that hopefully are having this resonate and be like okay this is why this is not just a conversation about sales it's really a conversation about like will your life feel of true value and 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 will you connect with that deeper sense of like pride that you've really lived or that sense of fulfillment or would you just feel like you just kind of did your time and pass through the you know the the gates of human history and then you know just moved on to the next experience and, and no one will remember you and all that stuff or or are you really going to be able to connect with something that's deeper and be able to look back on your life at any given point and be like i'm truly living my life you know like you yeah. said like I, I can say no to these things these multi-million dollar deals or whatever because i'm in my lane and i know what my passion my purpose is but i don't think you even get there until you start working through some of these traumas, these limiting beliefs, things that, that keep us from truly being able to listen and thus communicate, right? Yes, that is also spot on. I don't, I agree with you. I don't think you can get there truly without doing this work first, yeah. but, or not, but like just, and it's, it's just this ongoing thing too. I don't, it's not like one day you necessarily like have it all figured out. It's, it's just like right. going to the gym. I mean, you're just strengthening these life muscles that are called self-awareness and emotional intelligence, just like you go in and you do, you know, squats and hits the bench and whatever else, do some pull-ups. And yep. so yep. what's cool too is like when you're doing this work and you strengthen these life muscles, so to speak, it translates to strength in all these other areas of your life. And that's kind of, I guess we were talking about earlier, like, you know, the byproduct is being better at sales, maybe better in dating and relationships, being a better leader. Um, but it's the same thing. Like if you go to the gym and you do a handful of exercises, you can like, you know, come back to your apartment and like move furniture around because you're feeling strong. It's not like you're in the gym practicing and moving a couch, right? But because you've done the deadlifts, you're able to go, you know, move the thing. And so it's the same thing with life is it's like when you're, when you're strengthening these muscles, these life muscles, and getting more clarity on who you are and, and getting over your limiting beliefs and being more comfortable with exactly who you are, which is hard to do sometimes because in society, we feel like we're supposed to be sometimes like fit the mold or don't. Like I had a really big, you know, um, I used to be like so insecure in college and uh, right after college, I mean, for plenty of reasons, but a big one was like, I don't really care about football. <laughs> I just don't like, I love hockey. I grew up playing hockey and soccer. I love uh, surfing and, and snowboarding and yeah. all that. But like, I just can't sit around and watch football. I just have never been able to do that. I'll go watch live hockey games or I'll watch the Rangers in the playoffs. I'm a Rangers fan. Um, but I remember just like at college, like everyone had ESPN on all day. And then it was like Sundays we watching football day. And I, and I didn't grow up with that in my household either. So like when I got to college, it was actually like, I was like, Oh, so so you just have ESPN on all day. You just hear that on loop. That's just, you know, don't you already kind of know what he's like, you know, I'm like, this is. And so then I started to feel really insecure because I couldn't add to the football conversations. I'm like rushing yards. And I thought that I'm like, not a man. I'm not masculine. And I also grew up kind of like, you know, a little artsy and, you know, painting, photography, drawing and all that. My, my mom's had a family of unbelievable artists and um, my sister and my mom. But um, so I was insecure about that. I'm like, am I not manly? I'm, I must not be that macho. I can't talk about football all day. And yeah. it was only until my mid twenties when I started doing more and more of this work and really owning who I was that I know that that sounds kind of silly, but I would like try to hang out on Sunday when really I'm like, Oh, I don't really want to be here. Like, I love all these people. They're all great, but like, I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah. you know, do this <laughs> talk about football all day. And so I just started to really own that. And guess what? I wasn't like shunned from the group. I'm not like any less manly. I'm not like, you know, but we have all these ideas. So for anybody listening, like you might be 
I mean, I know personally, I know people in this spot exactly. They are on Wall Street wrapped up in the, in like the, you know, the hardcore finance bro thing. And I have yeah. some friends who love it and it fits them perfectly. And I have other friends who deep down, like want to be a piano teacher, want to just paint and travel yeah. and, and cook. Yeah. And, the, and yep. that would be su- for them, even, even though we both know they could just go decide to do that and it would be fine. The culture they're in is so wrapped up and maybe not that again, I'm not trying to like judge wall street, but it's just like you get in these cultures. So I, I remember I felt insecure about making a career change because I was so wrapped up in a corporate sales environment and all my friends were, you know, really, you know, hardcore sales, they were doing really well, making a lot of money. And I'm over here thinking like, at the time I had a a, a clever idea for an apparel product. And I was like, I want to go start this company. But I felt like insecure, because I felt I'm like, who am I to go do this thing when I'm, everyone else thinks of me as this sales guy, you know, corporate sales guy. And it might sound silly, it almost sounds silly to say looking back on it now. But like, I had to get over through coaching and practice and recognizing you feel insecure and then acting in a powerful way anyway, you know, just yeah. a million times a day, we're at a fork in the road of what we, we could do. We could act powerfully. We could fall back to our imposter syndrome and not post the video, right? Yep. Where, you yep. know, whatever. And so I started to recognize my forks in the road throughout the day. And I would be like, all right, I'm, I like, you know, it's kind of, scares me a little bit, but what am I really afraid of? Well, a little bit of judgment, but from who, who cares? All right, I'm going to go post the video anyway. Screw it. So little by little, I started to get more confident with who I was. All right, I'm going to go start this business because it makes sense to me. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter if it's a massive change from the path I was on, right? That's all made up in my head anyway. And so yeah. the, I would just encourage anyone listening to this to embrace the work and embrace who you really are, right? Because again, we don't need another disgruntled insert job title. We, the world needs your gifts actually more now than ever. The world needs people doing great work around the thing that they're truly passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I hope that, you know, people, you know, get on a path of some sort if they, to the degree that they can just start to do some work around self-reflection, working on those past traumas, if you want to call it that, or limiting beliefs or the stories you tell yourself that for whatever reason are holding you back from the thing that deep down you want to go do. If you can yeah. work on getting over those things, I mean, you're, it's just the, it's the best use of time ever. You know, it's the best work yeah. you could do for yourself. It makes me think of a, uh, you know, and it's a super short story. I just, I've never been a gamer. Uh, and certainly a lot of guys, you, you made me think of it like in college, a lot of my buddies were just all about playing video games, double yeah. seven or whatever. I fell like, off I after, like, uh, gonna- after Mario Kart N64, that was my prime. <laughs> and yeah, then after that, I was like, I don't know. Yeah, same, same as you. Yeah, it's like, I'm not going to waste my time doing this. I can see my whole college career going down the, or like all my moments going to video games. But I did have a moment in, in high school when I just, I just threw myself in for like three full days. I think I slept five or six hours a night. Otherwise, I was playing Zelda straight the whole oh. time. And I remember... I was, uh, after I beat the game, like, like a couple months later, I found, uh, at the mall somewhere, you know, like a, a book that had all of the cheat codes for Zelda. And I'm like, why would anyone buy this per se? Cause I had such a sense of like, ah, oh, I beat this game on my own. Right. Right. Um, but it made me think about how, when I went to my first Tony Robbins event, I felt like he was giving me the cheat code to fulfillment, you know? Wow. And I felt like all of the work that I've done, I would like, it's been, like I said, coaches, coaches and seminars and therapists and counselors and books and podcasts and retreats. And I could not have even begun to, to get where I am today without the help of other people. Right. 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 You know, other people's programs. And so why I say all that, because I want to want to kind of, as we kind of wrap things up, talk about how you guys offer workshops for corporations as well as courses for individuals, correct? In becoming yeah. uh, better at sales and better communicators and more emotionally you know, aware. Can you, can you kind of tell those that are listening or watching like, if it, is this, this is resonating, which I believe it will be like, okay, cool. This is, could be something that could be huge bringing into my corporation or shit at the very least yeah. I could possibly do this online course by myself. Like what are some of the things that, 
you guys offer to evolve. Yeah. And so um, the corporate training side of things. So we do some sales consulting. We have some uh, project-based clients that we have uh, that will work for you know a few months at a time, building out their sales departments that could come with training, but that could also be on the process side of things. But where our, our real focus is and what we love to do is training um, corporate teams. So that could be managers, especially new managers who are new to the role and they have to really grasp how to lead and influence. Um, and so much of that, obviously, you know, comes down to communication, um, yeah. work with other uh, employee teams at a company, and then also uh, sales teams specifically. And we will dive into how to be um, more effective communicators quickly. So I like the kind of like Tony Robbins style where he's like, he, it, he has like a special way of saying it, but he's like almost like a practical therapist or something. He has a more, he has a more powerful phrase behind it, but it's like, it's the 80, 20 rule almost of like, here's the 20% to focus on that will truly get you 80% of the way there. And you could start implementing these things right away. And so we help people become more effective communicators and we take a very practical approach to emotional intelligence yep. and self-awareness. So we don't go on this like long, boring theory of all these different subtopics. We pull out, we cherry pick the areas that move the needle the most that'll have the most power in your life. And we train on those and do exercises on those. And people really have massive transformations in who they are, how they show up in their relationships and how they communicate. So we do that for corporate teams. And then a distilled down version is uh, what's in our online courses and those around communication skills, um, sales skills, especially we have one for, uh, for founders and startups because um, that's kind of who we used to work with a little bit more. Now we're kind of going up market just a little bit. Um, and then other courses around self-awareness and, uh, and emotional intelligence and how you can apply that to um, navigating your career as well. Because it's all intertwined, right? It's basically get, get these skills and where do you apply them into your life, your career, your relationships, right. sales, management, wherever it may be. So um, yeah. And then if anyone wants to get in touch and they want to shoot me an email directly and reference the Becoming Kings podcast, happy to give a discount code there. We didn't have a link set up just in case this might be like, you know, six months or a year from now and the, the links uh, expired or whatever. But just email me directly. I'd love to hear from you. I love connecting with people and, uh, you know, interesting people of all walks of life. My email is alex at evolveleadership.co. Um, and I know we'll you know, link it and stuff too. But yeah, if you have a, if you're part of a corporate team and you think that your people or your managers or sales reps could benefit from being more effective communicators, getting along better, less arguments, less communication breakdowns internally and client facing. That's exactly uh, where we help. That's beautiful. I mean, why, who couldn't benefit is my question. It's just like, what uh, is the leadership focused on that or not? You know, do they, do they have the realization right. of how important that is for the success of their business or not? Um, I think that's beautiful. I, I, I'd say my very last question is, for those that that maybe want to jump on podcasts like like you do, would you suggest going to a Red Hot Chili Peppers concert the night before, staying out late, <laughs> and then jumping on a podcast like this? Is that effective? Does that work for you? Um, it. <laughs> I do not advise it. I would advise getting more sleep. But you know what? When you find out last minute that the Red Hot Chili Peppers are in Miami uh you go if oh, yes. one of my all-time favorite bands third time i've seen them they just got john Frashanti back and they fucking killed it it was so fun um yeah. and uh part of the reason why i knew i wanted to, to stay the course with the podcast even though was, you know uh feeling a little tired is because i knew this conversation was going to kick ass because you're awesome i love what you're doing i know we've connected a couple times already and so uh, as suspected, didn't even think about, you know, I wasn't tired at all during the whole conversation. I just was so completely present and stoked on, uh, on being here. So I want to thank you for having yeah. me, man. This has been fantastic. Hell yeah. You know, I live right near the uh, Broncos stadium in Denver. Nice. It was probably just a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, I know that music. It was a huge concert going. I was like, I think that's the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, Holy six. shit. I didn't even yeah. know. I would have, I would have gone had I known, but I was like literally outside walking the dog. I was like, 
Hell yes. I bet yeah. that was an amazing concert. I got to see I, them in, in concert as well. Oh, so good. I, I'm the guy like singing every every lyric at the top of my lungs. And there was a couple people around me who were like a little more quiet. And I'm like, yo, you're at a concert. I'm going to get this yeah. energy out of you. So I'm like, you know, arm around them, like standing in line to see the show tonight. Just get them all hyped up. And by the end of the show, yeah. everyone was just like, hooting and hollering and like you know hugging it out and high fiving because it was just you know the energy of I, I miss live music so much from uh obviously what we all just what the whole world just went through and so that's yeah. going to be a yeah. big focus for the for this year uh moving forward more live shows man hey man i went to one republic uh, a couple weeks ago and oh nice like, oh, so, so so good and like, yeah ryan tedder's so fucking uh that's awesome just, talented but anyways i digress so guys uh hit up alex alex at evolveleadership.co or you can i assume your website is evolveleadership.co as well yeah you website yeah all social channels i'd love to connect on linkedin um so i kind of post thoughts daily on linkedin and videos on uh tiktok instagram and facebook and all the channels are just you know evolve leadership um, our YouTube channel as well. I think it's Alex Resnick at Evolve Leadership because, uh, you know, the other the name was taken, but uh, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to hear from anybody. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you for kicking it with me. Thank you for bringing the, the energy and for pouring into the listeners. I think uh, this, again, this podcast and the message behind it, I don't think we'd be any more important, especially in today's day and age, you know, with men and women, uh, just yeah. us as human beings. So. Dude, thank you for, for being on. I appreciate you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. It's been great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for listening as always. Uh, feel free to check out Alex's stuff on social media. Give him a follow. Reach out to him. Ask him questions. Just look into it. Um, I think there's no point in necessarily really listening to a podcast like this unless there's going to be some sort of uh, follow, some type of action behind it. Otherwise, it's just, you know, you're, you're thinking that maybe – this is doing something for you, but you're not really getting any results. So reach out to Alex, reach out to me. If, if you have any questions on how to get in contact with him or whatnot, and we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you on the next episode of the Becoming Kings podcast. Alex, thank you, brother. Thanks again. See you guys.